Good morning, everybody, and you're very welcome to this, the seventh annual KT conference hosted by the School of Agriculture and Food Science in UCD and Chagask, entitled Innovation in Agricultural Extension and Education Looking Forward. My name is Jim Kinsler. I'm the Professor of Agricultural Extension and Rural Development at the School of Agriculture and Food Science here in UCD. We have over 300 registered participants from throughout Ireland, as well as from Northern Ireland, England, Scotland, Latvia, Lithuania, Greece, Cyprus, Serbia, Ukraine, Spain, and the US, to name but a few. The extraordinary circumstances we are all now living and working in have resulted in the conversion of our usual one-day conference into this two-day virtual event. This is a very busy webinar we have more studies and findings than ever before to share and discuss. We have six thematic sessions ranging from agricultural education to environmental sustainability to farm labor. There will be 40 presentations and six panel discussions over the next two days. We will begin this short opening session with the opening address by Chagas Director, Professor Jerry Boyle. This is followed by the keynote address from Professor Tom Kelly, Director of Knowledge Transfer at Chagask and Adjunct Professor at the School of Agriculture in UCD. Following this opening, we start the first of our three theme sessions today. Each session is led by a chairperson and co-chair and include presenters, uh, pre-recorded presentations, followed by a live panel discussion with the presenters themselves. Before all that, there's a few points to explain the running order of this webinar. There is a separate link for each of the theme sessions. These are listed in the conference program, which you received and are also available on the events page of the UCD School of Agriculture and Food Science website. We will also publish the link for the next session here at the end of each session. All sessions are recorded and will be available on the School of Agriculture and Food Science YouTube channel at UCD Ag Food in the coming days. For all who are active on social media, please tag at UCD Ag Food and at Chogusk and use the hashtag KTConf2020. During the panel discussions, we invite questions from the audience through the Q&A function, which is located at the panel on the bottom of your screen. Please submit your question at any stage throughout the session. Please note that the chat function is not in operation during the webinar. Also, there may be polls undertaken during some of the sessions, so please participate. Posters and abstracts for each of the presentations will be available in the coming days, and a link will be emailed to all registered participants. With all that said, I'm now very happy to welcome Professor Jerry Boyle, Chagas Director, to give us the opening address for this conference. Thanks, Jim, and um, good morning, everyone. Uh, Jerry Boyle is my name, and I'm the director of Chagask. And for all our international friends that have joined us this morning, Chagask is a Gaelic word meaning instruction. As Jim said, this is the seventh annual Chagask UCT uh, Knowledge Transfer Conference. And over the next couple of days, um, over about seven exciting themes will be addressed of critical relevance to the profession of extension and indeed to the future of agriculture in Europe. We, I think when you, as we proceed through the program, it will be evident that we're dealing with um, cutting edge developments in, in knowledge transfer. And uh, I think it particularly pleasing not alone that we had such a large attendance this morning, but that so many overseas um, colleagues from right around Europe are in attendance. Knowledge transfer um, has gone through a complete transformation over the last 10 or 20 years from uh, a model that was top down where the uh, agricultural advisor or extension officer um, tended to um, deliver from on high, so to speak, in terms of the agricultural knowledge, 
And I'm very happy to say that we're now in, uh, involved or engaged in a model that very much emphasizes peer-to-peer -peer learning. I guess some of my own colleagues have even said that the term knowledge transfer is a bit dated, that we should be increasingly using the term knowledge exchange. Um, one, there are a number of trends that have affected how knowledge is exchanged and transferred to the agricultural community. But one that has absolutely leaped to the fore in recent times is a, due to COVID, of course, is the extent to which now we rely, like we do today and tomorrow, or we will today and tomorrow, on digital communication. And there is a real challenge here for all of us to use this medium to the best possible advantage. And I think it's fair to say we're only learning in both education and probably we have further to travel when it comes to extension. Certainly, I personally envisage a future with online communication where advice will be very much data driven. And I think we're yet to see the full potential of that mode of engagement. Clearly the major challenges that face the agri-food industry require that we all work together in partnership. And I've been a long standing believer of the critical importance of a vibrant agricultural knowledge innovation system or ACUS. And very much an ACUS that puts the farmer at the center of our engagement, not as a, as a, as a passive uh, performer, if you like. And I think generally uh, around many of the great debates of the modern era, not least climate change, farming and farmers, I think, are misunderstood. Uh, and I think we do need to reach out to a, to a wider audience and to engage them actively. And I'm delighted to see so many papers or so many papers that address the, the issue of communication. As Jim said, um, we have a feast before us of over 40 papers and panel discussions. And these are going to focus on what we're doing well, but probably more importantly, uh, what we need to improve. And this is absolutely invaluable. I expect that many of our presenters today, indeed I hope this will be the case, um, who have completed the Masters in Agricultural Science and Extension, and indeed many others also, will continue to share their learning and contribute to the next generation of advisory and education specialists. And finally, Jim, I do want to thank um, yourself and in UCD and Monica Gorman, of course, and all of your colleagues for organizing uh, the event along with my own colleagues. And I might take this opportunity very briefly, Jim, as uh, Tom Kelly, Head of Knowledge Transfer in Chagas, is shortly to retire. <clears throat> I wouldn't like to let the opportunity go without paying tribute to Tom, uh, not least because of his central role, along with yourselves, in, in establishing the Walsh Scholars Programme. That has been absolutely invaluable, not only to us in Chagas, but to the entire agricultural community over the last five or six years. Tom, of course, is President Emeritus of UFRAS, and he has been honored by the Swedish, the Swedish Academy of Agricultural Science. It's been a great privilege for me um, over the last 10 years or so to work alongside of Tom, and he has simply been an outstanding leader of knowledge transfer in Chagas. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for that, Jerry. And I think there is very little I can add to what you've said in, in uh, reflecting on, on Tom and his contribution um, to, to the sector. Um, I, I have the great privilege of, of introducing uh, the keynote speaker uh, at this year's conference, uh, Professor Tom Kelly. Um, Tom has soldiered from local advisor through teacher at um, Agricultural College to specialist to managing the uh, extension and uh, education services uh, in Chagask um, over the past uh, 10 or 15 years. 
So it's with great privilege that uh, I introduce Tom, um, who is making our keynote address, and we'll be able to follow up with some questions straight afterwards. Tom. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizers of this conference. I've been involved in this conference for a number of years, and uh, certainly uh, people in UCD and Chagas put together an excellent program for, for this event. Um, I will, I'm very honored to be asked to deliver the keynote speech at this year's conference. Uh, it will be my last um, conference, uh, last KT conference uh, as Director of Knowledge Transfer. So um, I am uh, going to make a presentation, if I can get this to work, yeah, okay. So I would like to talk to you and present a reflection on technology networking knowledge exchange. And uh, I'm doing this, I suppose, in the context of uh, this particular conference, which is very much around uh, extension and education. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remind you of last year's inspirational talk by Mr. John Perry. I'm going to give you my opinion on what technology has empowered or enabled advisors more than any other. I'm going to look at some of the key lessons learned and maybe uh, challenge you a little bit to think about the future. So last year's KT conference, uh, we had a talk from John Perry, as I said, and we, he summarized the value of the simple cup of tea and the degree to which this enabled a, 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 a relationship building, or has a relationship building uh, effect with our clients, as, uh, students and parents of students, etc. And the importance of taking that time to have that cup of tea. So that was just 12 months ago, uh, for the last six months, sorry, we've had COVID, which interfered with that. But I'm sure people find ways and will, being humans, we will all find ways to interact, even if the cup of tea is not, uh, is temporarily not something that we can engage in, particularly in terms of farm visits, or uh, uh, both as advisors and educationists. So the technology that's empowered advisors more than any other, what is it? And no guess, it's the phone. And certainly when I started work in 1978, long time ago as a, contra as a temporary advisor, um, we sharing an office with one other advisor, we had one phone between us and then the next phone was a pay phone up the street. Uh, and um, yeah, it was uh, at that time, the key means of contact with all of our clients at the time, all the farmers in the area and with our own colleagues throughout the organization, which was the County Committee of Agriculture at the time. So nowadays, every advisor has a mobile phone. It's with them, dare I say 24 seven, but uh, it's obviously with them where they bring it with them, where they go and uh, always in contact and always contactable. Um, uh, unless they are sensible and switch off the phone, that is. Um, it still is the main source of contact with farmers. So the evolution of the phone, it's worth thinking back, it's a, rel it's a really rapid uh, advancement of technology. 45 years ago, Martin Cooper produced the first, as a, uh, designed and, and, and produced the first um, phone for Motorola. It was a mobile phone with a weighing a kilo and 20 minutes battery. 22 years ago, Nokia produced um, the, the, the 5110, which had text and games included. And uh, 13 years ago, Steve Jobs produced the iPhone. In 10 years time, yeah, will we have phones which are connected to our own uh, brains via our SIM cards that we insert somewhere in our brains that will help give us better memory, better functionality uh, in, and obviously maintain all the functionality that's there currently in the phone. So I'd like to just produce some some data here and this data is taken from Michael Hassett who is a 
the KT Walsh Fellow, and uh, he has done uh, 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 administered a survey of farmers in uh, a number of regions throughout the country and gathered the data from and this is some preliminary data from that study. So we see huge um, penetration of smartphones among farmers generally. Uh, mobile phone is, is at this stage, everybody has either a smartphone or a mobile phone, but the, the smartphone is gradually taking over, particularly with dairy and uh, with uh, tillage clients. When we look again at the use of some of the functionality of that phone, particularly just looking at WhatsApp, Certainly, it is again taking over as a uh, as a communications tool that advisors and farmers are using more and more. This is another piece of data from our own uh, internal customer satisfaction survey, called the Net Promoter Score Survey 2020, and just from one region, 480 clients were surveyed and uh, certainly the phone ranked very high here in terms of uh, clients being satisfied or very satisfied with the service they get via the phone. So equally when we look at the, their use, farmers use of technology and contact with Chagas in terms of in this particular region, again the text messaging seems to be very highly rated by clients. But in that, in that, we have to acknowledge that other uh, services through the mobile phone are increasing. So what we learned, we have multifunctional phones and what have we learned? First of all, uh, the phone is essential. The cost is, the phone is shut up by its value. I have recognized that as Director of Knowledge Transfer for a long time and approve new phones purchases for staff uh, almost on a daily basis throughout the organization, upgrades, etc. And I'm very conscious uh, of the value of it uh, in terms of its, uh, its uh, enabling uh, influence on farmers, and uh, sorry, on advisors and farmers. But I think we also need to look at the customer relationship value of it. So apart from the service value, there is a strong customer relationship value of it. Just like the cup of tea, the phone call at, to our client, the phone call to a parent, the phone call to a student could be really important uh, from a relationship point of view. I think we, we have to value that and, and certainly uh, utilize it more. COVID-19 has given us the digital nudge to do things different and certainly the capacity that's been there in our phones and in, in our in our smartphones has helped us to deal with our to do to do that and do it effectively. And we should have to think if we didn't have mobile phone, if we're still dependent on pay phone or our uh, desk phones, uh, how we would have serviced clients uh, over during the lockdown period, for example. So I suppose a couple of things that are maybe of issues are things like the phone etiquette. And I think there certainly needs to be a, 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 a strong culture within an organization of improving the, uh, the etiquette of how we use phones. Uh, certainly there are, the phones can have a distraction value and certainly we look at the, 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 the need to reduce our screen time uh, and to gain with some real one-to-one -one human contact. And of course, we also have those privacy issues, which uh, now with modern phones, the ability to collect and store and share data is, uh, is unending. And uh, we certainly need to be conscious of those issues. So I suppose if you Google phone and you get an awful lot of humorous uh, re answers back and uh, certainly I like these ones in particular um, and uh, I suppose look at they help us to maybe reflect a little bit on how we use phones ourselves. Again, uh, we certainly need to be very conscious of making uh, space to ensure that making space for human face to face contact to ensure that our that we value that time and that we use it effectively rather than being distracted by the phone. Yeah, phones are dur durable phones is a, is a hobby horse of mine and certainly I think that uh, we need to have uh, some 
issues around uh, phones which are designed for general consumption but maybe not that suitable for advisory or farm or agricultural applications where people are active etc i like this phone because it has a, an x strap you can get, you don't have to find a pocket to put it in it and you can't leave it behind you if you hang it around your neck the other issue is that phones are uh, less durable than maybe they used to be. Screens break and uh, we certainly have issues around. In my house, this is what I found in one drawer. Uh, I'm sure if I looked in other drawers, I'd find more. But phones are, um, are less, uh, are, are quite susceptible to breakages and etc. and damage etc. Battery life, other things giving up at them. So what is the future? And uh, this is very much for, for you to influence the, the, the public. And um, I think in within knowledge transfer, I, I would be very keen that we would concentrate on using all of our five senses in terms of how we work. And we add to use the phone to add to that capability that we have. So in other words, to improve all of our senses to, to use of the phone. So the future of advisory phones, uh, I think we have some challenges. Um, we need to use all the functionality uh, as best we can for servicing and for customer relations. And uh, we as well need to ensure that we stay in control. And I think uh, we need to be conscious of having space and time for normal mindful mindfulness and for contemplation and for uh, reflecting on what we do rather than being constantly plugged into the technology. And I think we certainly need to keep an issue, uh, keep a track of our, our own privacy and the privacy of our clients, students and etc. There are some opportunities. I think really the bigger opportunity is to make life easier and simply. If we look back, that's certainly what has happened. And I suppose finally to have fun. So I would like to thank you very much and to say, uh, please stay safe. And I really look forward to the uh, presentations for today and tomorrow. And uh, I wish you all very well and I encourage you to, uh, to stay safe and keep, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tom. Uh, that's that's great, and you certainly really highlighted the value added and the challenges um, of phones for advisory services. And I suppose all of us have my first question for you, and that is, how did the Kelly household break so many phones? You needn't answer that one. We'll move on to maybe a, a more, a more five fundamental. children uh, <laughs> and myself, the main culprits. Very good. Tom, um, 40 years and more to reflect on, on your experience so far. What advice do you have for young advisors and education officers starting out their careers? Yeah, I, 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 look, at, I think I've uh, been very fortunate in my career and uh, I suppose I, I would limit my, my advice to taking to, to advising uh, people to take the opportunities to, to learn and to profile themselves within their own organization, with their own clients, students, etc. Listen very carefully to others and learn from what they do. Uh, and I, I think, you know, that's the type of learning that you can't buy and you can't get in a classroom. It's, it's about uh, sticking with, with, the, with the initiatives that are the the opportunities that are there for formal learning, but equally the informal uh, ability to, to, to learn as you go. Thanks, Tom. Tom, you, you've seen the movement um, over the years from a predominantly what we can accept is transfer of technology approach by advisory services to the present era around co-creation of, of messages. Um, for example, the EIPs and discussion groups would facilitate that. How do you think the advisory and education services are equipped for this new era? Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're equipped better than we were in the past, but I think we still have room to go. Um, uh, certainly, I don't see that we will abandon all of our 
top-down or one-to-one -one type services for more group-based approaches. But I do think that we will see more of that and it will become more a part of what we do. So as the director mentioned earlier, the peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, uh, within our, I suppose, uh, list of services that we provide through discussion groups and through more interactive type learning classrooms, etc., and practical training of students. I think it's becoming much more acceptable. And, and if you look now at where how young people are, are learning in schools, they, they don't sit in rows of desks anymore, they sit around tables. And so the culture of learning has changed. It is more interactive. And I think this has always been the case with adults. And I think we make big mistake in terms of adult learning by forcing methodologies that we ourselves uh, I suppose participated in as students on adult farmers in particular. I think the idea that they, that they, um, that they have to learn in a top-down uh, environment is, 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 has been proved to be to be uh, flawed and we have I suppose approached it from a much more interactive approach and with that I see that the advance of discussion groups which we, we are I was very fortunate to be part of uh, and you know it's gone on there were discussion groups there even in 1978 when I was there there were some really excellent advisors who had groups at that stage but I think we've even improved the methodology of how we run discussion groups and we've learned a lot more about that interactive and it was no, no different. We learned a lot from what we, from our colleagues in Europe through SECRA, through how we train adult advisors and how adult advisors should respect uh, adult farmers in terms of training and, and supporting innovation. Okay, thanks, Tom. I'm, I'm conscious um, of, of the next session, but I know that Jerry has, has one quick question uh, to put to you. Jerry. Thanks, Chairman. I hope you can see me a bit better this time. Um, uh, no, I, I'm just, uh, I, look, I want to download Tom's knowledge before he goes, so uh, that's the basis of my, my question. Um, I think we'd probably all agree, Jim, that um, we'd like to see the role of the advisor as an interpreter of farm data rather than as a producer of farm data, which often is the case, and many advisors tell me that. In that context, I guess the question for Tom is, are we up really optimizing the potential of the smart phone? The smart phone enables massive amounts of data transmission to enable decision making. I'll give you an example, Pasture Base Ireland. Because I'm strongly of the view that we need to get to a point where we use this technology uh, in the form of what I call database decision making uh, in a joint sense between farmer and advisor. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, it, uh, to answer that, uh, Jim, I think I, 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 I didn't put up a, another piece of information that came from Michael Hassett's survey, which again is very recent. It's only in the last few months. So look at it, it is post COVID and it has, but very, what it shows is that while an awful lot of, while a high, very high percentage of farmers use their smartphones for, um, for, for example, WhatsApp, only about half of them that use WhatsApp use WhatsApp with their advisor. So again, this is, this is a, just an example of what Jerry's talking about. But whether it's bespoke applications like the pasture base, or whether it's more general communications uh, tools, I, I really do think that advisors need to be proactive and encouraging farmers to, to take full value and make full use of the, of the, uh, of the functionality of their phones. I mean, farmers live in, a, in, a, in the bigger world and they are using the phone for interactions with family, with GA clubs, with football, hurling, you name it across the board. And they don't differentiate whether it's, uh, you know, that the use of that technology for one purpose or another. They, they will grow and very much expect that that technology is what everybody is using nowadays. Uh, just like we use the, mo the, 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 the pay for, or the desk phones in the past, or the pay, for, pay phones. So I just see it as, as, as it being a responsibility on us to engage with, with our clients, on, with our students and with parents, et cetera, of, of students. And, and we do that in every way we can. 
and we use all of the methodologies. And if the if the, the that uh, phone offers additional functionality, like in the pasture-based example, or in in for example using um, the, the the phone camera, for example, for diagnostic purposes or for even downloading uh, um, information. I think it's really important that we up the ante and use it to that extent. Okay, th thanks, Tom. Uh, conscious of time, um, I'd like to wrap up this this opening session and, and thank yourself, in particular, and and uh, Professor Jerry Boyle for your your opening um, of this session. And I know Tom, you'll 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 be with us over the course of the two days as well. So I'm going to hand over now to the next session, session one, Opportunities and Challenges in Agricultural Education, chaired by John Parry and co-chaired by Dr. Monica Gorman. Hello all. Thanks very much, Jim. Really thought provoking words there from Jerry and Tom. I'm John Parry, I'm principal here at Gertine College in Tipperary. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to be involved again in this high profile conference. I think it's a very important conference, um, recognizing the great work and the great talent that uh, exists within agriculture. And having watched most of the presentations, believe you me, the future is in safe hands as some really talented individuals that you're about to, to, to speak. I'm really disappointed not to personally be in Dublin and to be able to share that cup of Barry's tea with everybody. Well stirred, of course. Um, but COVID dictates that we do this conference in a slightly different way keen to watch your presentations and uh, make sure that we take some real key messages for the people working in agricultural education and how they can learn from the process. Uh, we've got nearly 200 people in the audience and I, and I just want to give it a little bit of direction to, to, to the audience. So my challenge to, to the people in the audience is to try absolutely to make this an engaging process. Uh, we don't want it to be knowledge transfer. We want it to be knowledge exchange. We want it to be a two-way process. Can I remind people, therefore, that social media is, is a good way of doing that? Uh, the hashtag for the conference is hashtag KTConf2020. And there's a request that you at UCD Ag Food and at Chagas in any messages. So I'd like to see that uh, trending, please, and, and make sure that everybody gets going. I want to point out that the chat function in uh, Zoom is disabled, but the question and answer function is enabled. So if you've got questions as you're watching the presentations, please use the question and answer function and uh, the, the chairs will be able to see that and will be able to uh, uh, respond. At the end, there's going to be an opportunity to quiz the individual speakers. Uh, and I want to try and make sure that every speaker gets the opportunity to, 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 to add some context to the presentations. We're on quite a tight schedule. We've got less than 30 minutes for questions and answers. So I want to launch straight into the video. We've got eight fantastic speakers uh, about to talk to us about opportunities and challenges in agricultural education. We've got four that have completed research masters. We've got uh, one who is halfway through a research masters program and three that have completed taught masters. So if we can, could we start the videotape with the presentations, please? Thank you, John. Our first presentation in this session is from Roisin Horan. Roisin completed a research master's on continuous professional development for farmers. Good morning, everybody. My name is Roisin Horn, and the title of my study is Towards Developing a Continuous Professional Development Programme for Irish Farmers. So the objectives that were set out for this study are as follows explore definition for farmer CPD, quantify the extent of farmer CPD, investigate the CPD needs of farmers, and identify differences between what farmers want and need and what has currently been delivered by Chagas. So the development of a CPD programme in agriculture has gained considerable discussion over the past year within Chagas, and several meetings were held in its regard. 
Inclusion in these meetings gave a sense of the issues surrounding the development of a farmer CPD programme and also helped to guide many aspects of this study. In order to quantify the extent of farmer CPD currently being delivered by Chagas, records of Chagas events were obtained from the Chagas Sims database. These events were viewed over a three year period from 2017 to 2019, and a database detailing over 18,000 farmer events was created. The CPD needs of farmers were investigated from the perspective of the farmer themselves, as well as Chagas specialist advisors and education officers. By using this approach, what farmers want in terms of CPD, but also what farmers need was investigated. Once all of this data was collected, a gap analysis was then performed in order to identify differences between what farmers want and need and what has currently been delivered by Chagas. So it was clear from the results of this study that there is conflicting views as to the meaning and purpose of farmer CPD within Chagas. So Chagas staff agreed that <clears throat> farmer CPD was an ongoing process that allowed farmers to keep up to date, but they were uncertain about many other aspects of farmer CPD. So analysis of Chagas event data showed that Chagas deliver a wide variety of farmer events and do so through a range of mediums. However, within and between Chagas regions, there is a lack of consistency regarding how these events were described and what an event should consist of in order to warrant a certain description. The majority of farmers who had participated in Chagas events in the past year also planned on participating um, in the coming year. Farm walks, discussion groups and information evenings were the events of choice among these farmers. And when this information is compared with the Chagas event data that was presented on the previous slide, there's a surprisingly small gap in terms of the events Chagas are delivering and the events farmers prefer to attend. These farmers who are currently attending at Chagas events were also the farmers who indicated a requirement for additional CPD. And the more events attended by a farmer, the more likely they were to want CPD. The areas in which Farmers wanted CPD and the areas in which Chagas staff felt that farmers needed CPD differed. Farmers predominantly wanted CPD in the areas of technical agriculture, while Chagas staff felt that farmers required CPD in farm business management. Chagas event data did not contain any information on the learning covered at these events. And as a result, this study was unable to, was unable to determine whether there were any differences between what farmers want um, in terms of CPD uh, what farmers need and what has currently been delivered by Chagas. In terms of CPD delivery, both farmers and Chagas staff felt that CPD would be best delivered through discussion groups, interactive workshops, peer-to-peer -peer learning and blended learning. Broadly speaking, current Chagas events incorporate many of the delivery methods to which farmers and Chagas staff want CPD delivered. CPD scheduled in the evenings for one day over a series of dates are for half days best suited farmers. And while there are differences in terms of preference, the choices remain the same for Chagas staff. There was an agreement between Chagas staff and farmers as to the timing of CPD with the months of September to January suiting both. There was an appetite for recognised CPD among farmers with the incorporation of points or credits, accreditation and building up to additional qualifications favoured by farmers. Financial support for participation in CPD was favoured by farmer respondents. However, this was not as popular among Chagas staff with only half of respondents in favour of the suggestion. For both farmers and Chagas staff, there was no desire to make farmer participation in CPD compulsory. The findings of this study show that Chagas is already delivering a considerable number and variety of farmer events, which could potentially form the basis of a farmer CPD programme. However, in order to do so, a number of key deficits must firstly be addressed, and these include um, defining farmer CPD and farmer CPD events, setting and recording um, event learning objectives, recording and recognising farmer participation in in events, which would also recognise the efforts of Chagas in delivering such events. And finally, engaging with um, industry in order to effectively recognise um, farmer participation in CPD. So that's the end of my presentation today. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their time and 
Um, hope that you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Roisin. And now we have Mairead Quinn. Uh, Mairead also completed a research master's and hers was on innovative teaching methods for the delivery of the Chagas ed Distance Education Programme. My thesis, Analysis of Innovative Teaching Methods for the Delivery of the Chagas Distance Education Programme. My supervisors are Dr. Pork Williams from UCD and Brendan Gary from Chagas. I was based in the Chagas office in Ballinrobe for the duration of my research. Chagas Distance Education Programme consists of two certs, the Level 5 Certificate in Agriculture and the QQI Level 6 Specific Purpose Certificate in Farming. The students that tend to enter this course are usually mature students between the ages of 23 and 39. They must hold a major Level 6 non-agricultural qualification. The majority of the class is males, typically 85%. Most students will enter to be part-time farmers, combining this with a non-farming profession or occupation. Students tend to come from dry stock or suckler farming enterprises. One reason why they decide to complete the green search is to minimise future tax implications. Over the course of my research, Chagas were running 20 courses nationwide, with approximately 1,088 students enrolled. Key findings from the literature include Hupakova 2015 stating that there is a link between new teaching practices and innovative technologies. Also from the literature, it can be seen that there is no one definition for distance learning, but a variety that all centre around communication, technology and location. Literature from Hope and Kenya in 2001 stated that as educators, we must encourage the learner to be more involved in their learning, becoming more assertive in what and how they learn. A key point that I believe relates to this study was made by Van der Rist et al. 2018. Innovation in agriculture comes from educators' motivations. My objectives are to conduct an analysis on the delivery of the Chagas Distance Education Programme, to assess what advances are currently being implemented in the delivery of courses in agricultural education internationally and nationally, to identify and review what delivery methods are being used to develop e-learning and to distinguish if these new advances will be applicable to the Chagas Distance Education Programme. My methodology is made up of questionnaires, case studies and interviews. A questionnaire was administered to all Chagas Education Officers and interviews were conducted with members of the Curriculum Development and Standards Unit were interviewed. Two international case studies were also completed. The College of Agriculture, Food and Rural Enterprise in Northern Ireland was chosen due to its dedicated staff members to online learning and their ability to incorporate technology enhanced learning aids into their delivery methods. They are also in the process of developing a fully accredited online equine course. A second case study involves Scotland's Rural College, also known as SRUC. They have been leaders in e-learning and agricultural education since creating a dedicated e-learning team in 2005. They have developed innovative learning projects such as their digital classroom and they were winners of, of innovative and training awards in Scotland. Here are some of the findings as to why e-learning has been a success in CAFRI and SRUC. They have a dedicated course leaders who are passionate about e-learning. They listen to students' needs and opinions as to how they want to learn. They incorporate digital evidence into projects and assignment work. There is an open channel of communication between all staff with sharing of resources. They have realised the value of staff and will invest time and money in them. And they incorporate voiceovers and interactive learning in their teaching methods to reach more students. Findings from the Chagas Education Officer Survey and Curriculum Development Standards Unit interviews. There is a combination of learning methods being used which attracts more students and reaches more learning types. But there also is a lack of understanding and knowledge of e-learning. There is no lead driver of e-learning with a distinct vision for the future of e-learning. They have technology literate staff which is a big advantage and they also have a technology experienced student profile. 
From my research, I have proposed recommendations to Chagas. The creation of a distance learning team to forward the growth of e-learning in Chagas. Continuous Moodle training for staff. Standardization of delivery across courses. Investment in staff. Framework or plan for the future of distance education program and relabeling of the distance education program. The distance education program is an excellent course with great potential. Thank you. Thank you, Mairead. And now Aoife Rooney, uh, who completed her research masters on the rollout of online assessment across Chagas education courses. Hi everyone, my name is Aoife Rooney and the title of my project was to determine the human factor and technical parameters for the optimal rollout of online assessment in Chagas education courses. While I was completing this project, I was based in Ballyhays Agricultural College and my supervisors were Dr. Tomas Russell in UCD and Dr. Brian Morrissey based in Chagas. In the next few slides, I will highlight some of the details of the project and some of the key findings and recommendations as a result. The rationale behind this project is to enhance learning using online assessment. As you can see, McAvoy highlights that assessment plays an important role in the way that students learn. And we need to develop a method that helps the student to enjoy assessment and a process that suits them. Suits them. There are three objectives for this study. One, to identify the factors impacting on online assessment in Chagas. Two, to develop a pilot online assessment system. And three, to outline a set of recommendations for the optimal rollout of online assessments within Chagas education. Chagas education. To carry out the study objectives of this project, I decided to use a co-design approach. Co-design uses feedback from key stakeholders in order to develop and implement a system that will work for the end user. As you can see from the methodology graphic here, uh, the first step was to do a literature review. This gives background knowledge um, on online assessment and how it's carried out. Next, I needed to identify the factors impacting online assessment. I've done this through four semi-structured interviews and a design workshop carried out with four members of staff. Next, I needed to develop and implement the online assessment. So I carried out surveys with staff and students, and I took the findings from them surveys back to the design workshop with the four key members of staff. Next, I needed to test and evaluate the system, so I carried out a pilot revision online assessment and to evaluate I used a survey. Online assessment and to evaluate I used a survey. Here are some of the key findings highlighted from the interviews that I conducted. These could be separated into two categories, both human and technical, and the factors within those, those categories. These factors are very important as these were the foundations for the next steps within the project. project. Moving from the interviews, here are some of the key findings highlighted from the student survey I conducted. As you can see, 82% of the students that were surveyed said that they would like to use online assessment in the future. When asked if they would like to use online assessment throughout the course, rather than using it as a final exam, 67.1% of students said they would rather use it throughout the course. When asked to highlight some of the advantages of online assessment, the students highlighted it could be quicker, there could be less writing, and it could be easier. When asked to highlight some of the disadvantages, they highlighted that it could be hard to use, they have a lack of computer skills and it could be faster to write. They have a lack of computer skills and it could be faster to write. Here are some of the key findings highlighted from the staff survey. As you can see, 65.5% of staff wanted to use online assessment as a means of formative assessment at different intervals throughout the course rather than the final exam. 72.8% of staff also felt that online assessment would increase learning performance. Learn performance. Here are some of the key findings highlighted from the pilot assessment carried out. There were 65 students in total, 41 full-time students and 24 part-time students that took part. 51.6% of students were very satisfied with the overall experience of online assessment and 72.6% of students felt that online assessment was actually easier in comparison to their traditional exams. To their traditional exams. Here are some of the recommendations for effective online assessment. First, a system review should be carried out annually to ensure online assessment is meeting Chagas education requirements. Next, an online assessment quality assurance policy should be drawn up so all staff are aware of how to carry out online assessments in relation to QQI standards. Moodle is the virtual learning platform being user present, but both staff and students have highlighted how hard it is to navigate and it's not very user friendly. Chagas should maybe look at an alternative platform for the future. Learning support should be provided to all students who require it, and they should not be at any disadvantage carrying out online assessments in comparison to traditional settings. 
Training should be carried out with staff members. Staff have highlighted that they would prefer workshop style training events to gain the most from it. Lastly, a working group could be set up between IT, curriculum development, teachers and education staff to allow for any issues that are on the ground to be highlighted and amended. This allows for continual feedback and continual growth of the online assessment system. This allows for continual feedback and continual growth of the online assessment system. That's the end of my presentation. I hope you all enjoyed it. I would like to thank you for your time and patience and I welcome any questions that you may have on online assessment or about the project in the panel discussion later. Thank you again. Thank you, Aoife. And next we have John Maguire, who also completed a research master's and his was on equipping Chagas teachers to use a problem-based learning approach. Hello, everyone. My name is John Maguire. You're very welcome here to this virtual conference today. The title of my research is Towards Equipping Chagas Teachers to Use a Problem-Based Learning Approach. My supervisors were Dr. Alan Kelly in UCD and Mr. James Marr in Chagas. For the duration of my research, I was placed in Ag Kiltalton Agricultural College, Piltown, County Kilkenny. So to give a little bit of background on problem-based learning, otherwise known as PBL, PBL is a student-centered learning approach where teachers become facilitators of group work as students work their way through a presented problem. If you think about traditional learning, the usual scenario is that we're told that we need to know, we memorize it, and we use that memory to either answer a question or solve a problem. It's very much an individual dynamic. In contrast, problem-based learning is where a problem is assigned to a group of students, and those students are asked as a group to try and solve this problem. And through the process of solving this problem, the students pick up the information that they otherwise would have been told in a traditional learning environment. The Chagas Education Vision and the Department of Education and Skills recognize the increasing importance of transversal skills for our students such as communication, collaboration, teamwork, etc. Problem-based learning is seen as a method of developing these transversal skills in our students further. The objectives of this study was to identify the benefits, challenges and implications of PBL as a teaching approach in education, to determine the teacher knowledge and attitudes towards PBL, to identify the models of PBL most suitable for Chagas education, as well as the area of Chagas where it would suit best. And finally, to identify teacher support resources for those delivering education using a PBL approach. The methodology used in this study was a mixed methods approach. First up was a questionnaire with all Chagas tutors. Secondly was a focus group, which was used to go in more in-depth analysis and discussion on some of the topics that came up in the questionnaire. And finally were semi-structured interviews with PBL practitioners and researchers to get some expert knowledge opinion on the subject. Some of the key findings on knowledge and attitudes was that 74% of respondents thought that new innovative teaching approaches such as PBL were either extremely or very important. This is a very positive attitude and it was a welcomed result. Secondly, participants thought that the combination of problem-based learning and traditional teaching is what would suit Chagas best. So kind of a balance between the two where each method would complement each other and lead to an overall better experience for the student. Some key findings on the models and areas. As you can see in this slide, there's three main ways that an institution can adopt problem-based learning. At the bottom, we have the individual level, is where one teacher in a certain area of a module decides to do PBL. A system or a group level is when a certain part of a module, or, or indeed an entire module across the board is used during, using a PBL approach. And then an institution level, which is at the top, is where all uh, modules, all areas of that curriculum across the board use a problem-based learning approach. The results of this study found that there is no better motivator than a small bit of success. And therefore, what the recommendation is that establish where PBL will work best, start small and build on that success. So kind of a bottom-up approach from an individual level leading up towards a system or a group level. From this recommendation, the hybrid PBL model approach. What I mean by hybrid PBL model approach is that, as the participants said in the questionnaire, where you use a balance of traditional teaching and also problem-based learning. And also the level six curriculum was seen in Chagask as a better area, more suitable to this uh, style of teaching. And also the students might be a little bit more mature at the level six. Some of the key findings on challenges and supports was that there was a lot of learning outcomes in Chagask that needed to be covered. 
this may be a, an issue. And that's where the hybrid problem-based learning comes into it. You have your traditional teaching to make sure and cover the basics. Secondly, the assessment. The assessment must reward a student for what they've done. So using the likes of peer assessment, self-assessment, and even projects was seen as a way around this. Some supports put in place. Teachers must experience PBL first before they can fully understand it. And that is where the training workshop comes into place. The word workshop is very important. The teachers need to experience the PBL problem themselves during that training in order to fully understand it. And then finally, it's essential to have someone as a point of contact or a support for teachers. It's well documented in the literature and also during the results of this study that a, a coordinator or a point of contact is extremely important to maximize the success of PBL into an institution for the first time. That's it uh, from me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John. Next, we have Margaret Farrell, and Margaret is midway through her research master's on diversity and inclusion in agricultural education. Hello, everyone. My name is Margaret Farrell, and the title of my research is Diversity and Inclusion in Agricultural Education, the Experiences and Perspectives of Staff Working in Chagas Vocational Agricultural Education. For this research, I am based in Ballyhays Agricultural College in County Calvin, and my supervisors are Dr. Monica Gorman of UCD and Dr. Brian Morrissey of Chagas. Okay, so what is diversity? Now, some of you may have heard of the nine grounds of discrimination listed here. However, diversity can be so much simpler than that, in that it can be anything that makes someone different in any way. Inclusion is making these people feel valued. It is recognizing, understanding, and respecting all the ways people differ. So why is diversity and inclusion important? Well, many studies have shown that in an education context, they can enrich the learning experience. Furthermore, having a welcoming diversity within organizations is much more reflective of society. The aim of this study is to see if there have been any factors adapted in Chagas education to accommodate diversity and inclusion. Here I have just a few quotes from some papers on diversity and inclusion in agricultural education. There is an abundance of work on diversity and inclusion in education. However, specific literature on agricultural education is limited. However, all the papers I do have point to the importance of an inclusive learning environment, both in and out of the classroom, and the vital role of staff and educators play in this. This is why we decided to look at all education staff's experiences and perspectives. So for my methodology, firstly, I completed an online questionnaire. From this, I used purposive and snowball sampling to select participants for semi-structured interviews. From these semi-structured interviews, we hope that a case study or two demonstrating good practice may emerge, and we may follow up with a final questionnaire, but its usefulness will be dependent on what areas arise from the interviews and case studies. So my progress to date. Back in January, I completed my proposal and my ethics, and currently ongoing are my literature review and my reflective journal. On the 21st of May, I sent out my questionnaire to staff via an email link. The survey was delivered via the survey monkey medium. For this questionnaire, the target population was Chagas education staff. Under this heading, I include a large group of staff to try to gather a wide variety of perspectives and opinions. The survey was sent to Chagas colleges, private colleges and regions and offices. From the surveys, I have identified participants for semi-structured interviews based on profiling questions to again ensure a widespread of perspectives and experiences. So there were 67 responses to the survey and overall good engagement with a good location spread. 37% said that Chagas learning environment was somewhat diverse, while 35% said it was mixed, but just 2% of respondents said that it was homogenous. On the screen here now, I have some quotes of people's perspectives of the diversity in the Chagas learning environment. So one person said, agriculture, horticulture and equine students are all very different. They tend not to mix well. Each course attracts a very different type of person. Another described it as being a bit one dimensional. Another said that there was only about 10% female students. Um, another person said that the distance education cohort of students present the widest diversity. And another said that there was not many non-nationals, travelers or et cetera. And they described the main diversity as being in the form of gender. On this slide, I have some examples of inclusion in Chagas education that are taken from the questionnaire. One person described how a non-Irish national who did not have English as their first language was giving mentoring and encouragement to persevere. Another explained how Kildalton have installed a ramp to allow students who use wheelchairs to access the catwalk of the cattle crush. 
another described their classes as being quite varied and seemingly tolerant of diversity. And another explained that in their experience, any students that don't have a home farm, for example, get sample case studies for assignments. So what are the implications of this research? It ties in heavily with the Chagas People's Strategy, the Chagas Education Vision Report and the Chagas Diversity and Inclusion Policy. More importantly, though, it will offer validation and support to staff who've been formally or informally promoting diversity and inclusion. And it will also provide descriptions of how different contexts within Chagas Education are performing. And this will hopefully enable us to make recommendations of improvements while also recognising what is working well. Thank you for your time and I welcome any questions or feedback. Thank you, Margaret. And now we have John Donoghue. John completed a taught master's and for his thesis, he looked at global competence in Irish agricultural education. Good morning. My name is John Donoghue and today I'll be presenting my thesis topic, Agricultural Coordinators Attitudes Towards Education in Global Competence for Post-Secondary Agricultural Students. The OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development 2018, have developed the Programme of International Student Assessment, PISA. In the document, the OECD have created the Global Competence Framework, from which formed the basis of this study. The framework concentrates on four aspects. Examining local, global and intercultural issues, understanding and appreciating perspectives and worldviews of others, engaging in open, appropriate and effective interactions across cultures, and to take action for a collective well-being and sustainable development. In my research, I paid particular emphasis on the education of local, global and intercultural issues. Andreotti 2014 state, if there is a lack of education in local, global and intercultural issues, it may unintentionally affect the relationship of groups within a community and beyond, and could cause inequality, strain global citizenship, diversity and social responsibility. The inclusion of global competence education in agriculture could help Ireland meet targets set by the Ireland's National Skills Strategy 2025, while simultaneously meeting sustainable development goals in order to improve lives, creating better work environments and driving sustainable economic growth and development. Another source states that a successful approach to global competence has the potential to increase the level of meaningfulness and encourage students to deal better with and make better use of local, global and intercultural issues in their lives. For my research, I use a mixed method approach. Firstly, I researched any policies relating to global competency from relevant institutions at Irish level. These were the Department of Education and Skills, the Higher Education Authority, Chagas, and the Enterprise Training Boards Ireland. Secondly, I created a database of QQI level 5 to 8 courses in agriculture that a graduate will graduate with at least a green certificate. In this, course content was examined in relation to global competency. Semi-structured interviews were also carried out with programme coordinators and heads of agricultural education in these further and higher education institutions. These individuals were chosen for the interviews as it was felt that these were the individuals that have the most influence on course content of their respective programmes. Moving on to key findings, I've broken these down into levels of all programmes. From the level 5 and 6 programmes in agriculture, the main providers of these courses are the ETB and Chagas. No course explicitly mentioned local, global or intercultural issues in any module title. In the QQI Level 6 programmes, the specific purpose courses, sustainability is explicitly taught in terms of the environment in the Sustainable Farming in the Environment module. From the figures shown, other represents modules that are considered technical agriculture, such as beef husbandry, dairy husbandry, grassland management, etc. From the figures shown, it can be said that Chagas have more focus on intercultural relating modules than compared to the ETBs. In the QQI Level 7 programmes, again, there is no explicit mention of local, global or intercultural issues in the module titles, but terms such as international and rural were mentioned in module titles in the BSc in Agricultural Science course in Cork Institute of Technology. The term Irish was only mentioned once in the study of all the modules in the programmes, including Level 8. 
from all global competencies identified, examining global issues features more strongly with minimal content relating to local issues. In the QQI Level 8 award, it is clear that there is more focus placed on rural topics, with an increase in modules relating to agricultural economics. Global is explicitly mentioned for the first time in any of the modules examined, which was found in the Global Food Policy module in the BSc Honours in Agricultural Science in University College Cork. There is no explicit mention of local or intercultural issues in, level, in any Level 8 programme. There is little difference in the proportions of modules apparently dedicated to global competence at QQI Level 8 in comparison to Level 7. Finally, my conclusions and recommendations. Agricultural courses do not have a set standard of global competency education in Ireland. Current educational strategies by individual institutions linking local and global education with sustainability have proved to be successful according to participants. Recommendations arising from this study are that global competency education should continue to be developed in Irish agricultural education, particularly aspects of local, global and intercultural issues. A standard of global competence education must be in place for all programmes in agriculture in order to prepare graduates for a more globally aware society. Cultural education should be promoted in agricultural education in the viewpoint that this education can lead to positive results in solving economic, political and ecological problems. Education institutions should collectively establish a strategy for education in global competence in both further and higher education to ensure appropriate education for students of all pillars of the global competency framework. A clear focus must be set to develop global competence education in relation to cultural awareness for students across the programme, not just for those going abroad. Another focus must be set for preparing global competence graduates with a focus set on agriculture as a global industry instead of preparing for the agricultural system in Ireland alone. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, John. And next we have Teresa McGowan, who also completed a taught master's, and she looked at the attitudes of level six agricultural college graduates to hedgerow conservation. Hello everyone, my name is Teresa McGowan and I'm here today to talk to you about my thesis. My thesis was on level six graduates in agriculture and their attitudes towards the conservation of hedgerows. So what in this presentation what I'm going to talk to you about is the reason why I chose this as my research topic, how I conducted the research, my overall findings and then my conclusion. So for most agricultural graduates, if not all, Agricultural college is their last educational step. So therefore, the information they possess and the attitudes they have shape their future farming decisions. There was two research methods used in the thesis. The first was a quantitative method in the form of a questionnaire, and the second was a qualitative method using semi-structured interviews. So the questionnaire. The questionnaire consisted of 19 questions the first five questions asked about the individual's background. The following 14 questions were then designed to determine the level of interest the individual had in learning and then their knowledge and attitudes towards hedgerows. The majority of these questions were measured using the five point Likert scale. So the individual was asked a question and then they were given five options. An attitudinal scale was also included in the questionnaire to determine the environmental attitudes of the recent graduates. So for my thesis, I used a new ecological paradigm by Dunlap et al 2000. This consisted of 15 statements and then the students would reply to them statements which how much they agreed to them. So let's say strongly agree to strongly disagree. So then the questionnaire link was sent out. Now the questionnaire link was sent out person to person. So I sent out 15 links to recent graduates and they then sent out links to their fellow graduates. Semi-structured interviews were also completed. This was to gain a deeper understanding of the, the students' knowledge, attitudes and the practices that they have to do to conserve hedgerows. So a total of 10 semi-structured interviews were completed and they lasted 30 minutes and they're all by phone. So I had five female and five male participants and they were selected from a set of criteria just to ensure that there was different farmer experiences. 
So the criteria included um, whether they were a full-time or part-time farmer, full-time, part-time student, whether their uh, farm enterprise was beef, sheep, dairy, tillage, or then if they were a farm owner per, um, partnership. What was determined, as you can see, was a large portion of students understood the contribution ahead of the farm. What was also noted was that the confidence a student had in maintaining a hedgerow matched their likeliness of maintaining a hedgerow. And in the small amount of cases that their confidence wasn't high, it didn't affect the likeliness of them maintaining the hedgerow. What was noticed in the attitudinal scale was that there was a very high amount of pro-environmental attitudes within the graduates. However, during the interviews, it was found that there was a disconnect or disinterest when the term environment was mentioned. Now, when further questioned, the students referred to all the rules within the environment. Now, this possibly contributed to the environment being viewed in a negative light. It is evident from the questionnaire that the majority of agricultural students have pro-environmental attitudes. This allows for a greater base to learn new environmental information. However, the way that information is presented is causing a barrier between the student and the information. Therefore, relating the environmental information in terms of the benefits to the farmer directly may result in a stronger comprehension alongside indirectly increasing environmental conservation behaviours. Thank you and have a good day. Thanks, Theresa. And now we have Niall Kearns, and Niall also completed a taught master's, and he examined the role of agricultural media in knowledge transfer and farmer education. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and my name is Niall Kearns, and today I want to present you a study on the current use of agricultural media to transfer knowledge and implement change on farms. From the onset, I would like to sincerely thank my supervisor, Dr. Tomás Russell, who gave me tremendous support, guidance and advice while I was completing this study. Furthermore, I would like to thank Mark and Affirma and UCD, who gave me the opportunity to partake in this message beginning in 2018. And finally, I want to sincerely thank the great lecturers in UCD, the personal in Makra, my great family and friends and work colleagues in Chagas who give me great support and guidance throughout this master's program. The rationale for this study. Farmers acquire advice on a regular basis to aid them make better management and strategic decisions on farms. For example, farmers can seek advice in areas on grassland management, technical advice, breeding advice, veterinary advice and the list is endless. Farmers can seek advice from one-to-one -one advisory service, peer-to-peer -peer learning, discussion groups and local agricultural radio stations. Although farmers can seek advice from many different avenues and many different professions, farmers can also seek advice from reading newspapers and newsletters on a regular basis, as reading alone offers farmers the opportunity to improve their knowledge and expertise in certain areas in, the farming enterprise, in their farming enterprises. Research objectives. Number one was to assess the role of media uses to transfer knowledge and implement change on farms. Number two was to assess reading habits in an online or print based media a usage among farmers. Number three was to identify articles that attract a large target audience. And number four was to identify reading trends that may emerge from respondents across different enterprises. The methodology. The study gained exemption from full ethical approval from UCD prior to data collection. A literature review was conducted, an anonymous survey was conducted capturing the research objectives for this study, and farmers were targeted at random for the survey using Google Forms for farmers across different age categories, different family enterprises, and from part-time to full-time farmers. The results. In the survey, 157 males and 24 female farmers partaked, equating to 181 respondents in total. 101 respondents were full-time farmers, while 80 were part-time farmers. It was very interesting to note that 43.6% of full-time farmers and 43.7% of part-time farmers have changed farming practices based on recent articles that they have read. This is very interesting to see as media articles, be it online or print-based media, proves to be a popular avenue for farmers to acquire advice. 
On the table here, you can see the farm enterprise and age bracket of respondents. For example, in dairy, there was 26 dairy farmers in the 18 to 25 age category. In the beef sector, 18 farmers were in 26 to 35 age category. And you can see across the different age categories and family enterprises where respondents lie, equating again to 181 respondents in total. In this survey, farmers asked would they prefer online or print-based media. It was interesting to see that online-based run out on top with 104 respondents choosing online-based, while 74 respondents chose print-based, and three respondents had no preference across online or print-based media. One of the main research objectives of this study was to identify articles that attracted a large target audience. In this figure here, you can see the articles ranking from highest to lowest that attracted people to read from different farming enterprises, and grassland management won out on top with 130 respondents selecting this option as an area of interest which they like to read when they are reading in media articles, be it online or print-based media. And you can see the list down along on the left-hand side. In conclusion, and implementing the key findings, younger farmers in this study prefer online media and were more willing to change farming practices from reading compared to older farmers surveyed. Time spent reading has decreased in recent years and journalists need to continue diversifying their writing styles and techniques as to meet reader demand. In this survey, farmers were given the opportunity to tell us what they would like to see in the future of media articles or where they see the future of media articles going, and time constraints was a major issue with some farmers. Journalists need to have a keen interest in topics they write and engage regularly with end users. In this study, dairy farmers perceived to have a strong demand for technical information compared to other farming enterprises. Other farming enterprises such as beef, sheep and tillage, the study found that they have a stronger demand for articles related to EU grants and schemes. I'd like to take this opportunity and thank you for your attention and I now welcome any questions that may, you may have. Thank you, Niall. And now I'll hand you back to John, who will lead the panel discussion. Hello, all. Hopefully you're back live with me. I I'm sure you can agree that was quite some session, eight fantastic presentations. And uh, if we were live in Dublin at this moment, I'm sure that we would be cheering and clapping and showing our deep appreciation to all of the presenters. So perhaps we can do that in a virtual world and, and, and panelists, I hope you get a genuine feel for, for how much excitement and uh, enthusiasm you've generated. So on behalf of everybody, well done, absolutely superb. Panelists, if I can ask you to maybe turn your cameras and your microphones on and we'll start the uh, question and answer session. Thank you. First question is, is one which I want to ask uh, directly from the chair, and, and I'm going to ask it to each panelist individually. And I, I guess it's a little bit of a personal reflection. My 52-year-old brain uh, finds it difficult to uh, keep and whole retain uh, lots of detailed information and there was a wealth of information presented. So I'm really going to challenge you to say, I want you to summarize one take home message, one key thing you would like me as a professional working in agricultural education, as a principal at Gertine, one key recommendation from your study you'd like me to remember. So I, I'm going to start uh, with, with Roisin. Okay. Um... I think one of the main recommendations um, that I have for my study is that I suppose chags are already delivering a lot of uh, farmer events um, and there is a certain percentage of farmers that are engaging and attending these events um, and I suppose any move towards developing um, a CPD program I think it's important um, that they're not um, overlooked in the process so that's one of my um, key recommendations. Thank you. Thank you Roisin that's brilliant. So, so uh panelists you, you may have guessed I'm just going to go in the order down down the list of presenters so Mairead your next one key recommendation from your presentation please. Uh, mine would have to be that the Chagas course has so much potential for growth in terms of um, online assessment and online delivery but the use of digital evidence 
um, being going forward, I think there's great potential for there, especially in the current climate that we're dealing with, the COVID restrictions and the limited contact between um, education officers and students. Um, incorporating, incorporating digital evidence, there's huge potential for, and I think it is an option going forward. That's really thought provoking, Ray. Thank you. Aoife, key yeah. recommendation. Yeah, so um, as part of my study, I was looking at co-design um, and that was taking key, you know, parties involved in online assessment and education in Chagas. I suppose I would say I would like to, you know, keep that up. And one of my recommendations was to have a working group between the likes of IT staff, education staff, curriculum development staff, and any issues that are, you know, on the ground or anything like that there could be highlighted by teachers to, you know, IT staff and that there's a collaborative kind of thing going on there that, you know, that everyone can input any changes that need to be put in place and that they all work together to make sure online assessment uh, is run effectively. Power of a team, I think is the answer there. Yeah, Ethan. yeah. Excellent, thank, thank you. Uh, John. Same question to you. What the key single recommendation from your presentation, please? Yeah, thanks, John. Um, so you may remember there that one of the recommendations I had was about a training workshop for teachers to show them or to tell them exactly what PBL is and, and, and how to do it. I suppose the key part I want to look at there is the fact that the best way to tell people what PBL is or to show them how it works is to actually put them in the deep end and put them straight into a problem. Um, if I think back to my first experience with PBL all, all over two years ago, it was exactly that. Um, I was part of a workshop and I didn't know much about it and I was put straight into a problem. And I think that's the best way to introduce the topic, whether it's to students or to teachers. I think for them to experience PBL is the best way to show them what it is and what it's about. That's, that's the main thing I could say. Thank you, John. So, so very clear that you want teachers to experience PBL for themselves. Exactly. That's exactly it, John. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Margaret, we're, we're coming to you. So diversity and inclusion was your topic and we're looking for that one key recommendation. Appreciate yeah, we're only halfway through your study at the moment, so it's maybe a challenge. Yeah, exactly. I'm only at the data collection stage of my uh, research, but I suppose from, I can only comment on my preliminary findings, but uh, they seem to indicate towards more, a need for more exposure, awareness, and I suppose discussion around the types of differences that are encountered in Chagas education. Really interesting. Thank, thank, thank you, Margaret. I, I just want to check, Monica, if you're online, is John Donoghue been able to join us this morning or not? Uh, John had a family issue this morning and hasn't been able to join us. Okay. So we'll, we'll move on. I, d I didn't want to, to skip over John with, without giving him the opportunity, but we'll move on to Teresa. So to, 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 Teresa, you were telling us about conservation of hedgerows and how that might be a, a proxy attitude towards environment and those sorts of things. Could, could you give us that one really key message that, that you think comes out of the presentation? I think just keep bringing it back to the farmer, the farmer on the ground, they them, so focus all information towards them more so, so they can pick it up and then it can be um, like, it can lead on to helping with the environment and lead on to the conservation, as in if they know what they're doing, it, they'll get there, they'll get there as long as you make it clear to them why you're doing it. And I suppose, like Jerry Boyle said, farmers have the important role, like it's not a passive role. Make sure we're focusing our message on the farmer. I think, I think Teresa, is that, is that a key message there? Thank you. Yeah, sorry. sorry yeah. So finally, uh, uh, in, in terms of a generic question, Niall, same for you. So role of agricultural media in, in knowledge transfer and knowledge exchange. What, what would be your key single message? Yeah, so one of my objectives from this research was to figure out, do farmers change practices based on reading media? And one of the key findings I found, and something that kind of a take-home message, is that younger farmers in the study that I did were more open-minded to transfer, or to, 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 I suppose, to read, read information, first of all, but also implement change on farms compared to older farmers. So again, I suppose, going forward, that, you know, media maybe should be targeted more towards younger farmers in the instance that 
younger farmers have, I suppose, access to mobile phones or smartphones, and information targeted to dim type farmers seem to be more, it seems to be get out in farms quicker, and there seems to be a bit of change in farms compared to, to older farms. So that was one uh, key aspect I found in my study. Thank you, Niall. So, so everybody's had the chance to speak. We, we've tested the technology and it's great news. All of our panelists are live with us and the cameras and the microphones are working. So that's brilliant. But we're gonna, we're gonna go to some more specific questions and we've got a series of questions that have already come in on the, the question and answer session uh, from, from the Zoom. Um, and, and I'm going to start, Niall, to stay with yourself, being as we've got you on screen at, at the moment. Uh, and um, it was really interesting that you said that, that there was some clear evidence that younger farmers were more likely to change their attitudes as a result of, of interacting with, with, with ag media. And I, and I wondered whether there was any evidence about what type of ag media particularly had an influence on them. You know, was it the written or, or was it podcasts or short video clips and those sorts of things? Yeah, so this research um, uh, primarily dealt with, we'll say, written media, be it online or print-based media. And from maybe some of the graphs that I showed earlier on in my presentation, um, it, articles, technical information in relation to grassland management, um, soil fertility, um, and that kind of thing, them articles seem to be the highest preference, you know, chosen, are supposed to be the, they're the articles that are chosen, the highest preference to these farmers. Um, so I would say, you know, in particular dairy farmers, younger cohort of dairy farmers, um, seem to show that, again, that the grassland management was something that they're more interested in really technical information. Um, I suppose if when they kind of implement this information when read, they can see real results quickly, you know, so that would, um, the, the articles in that area would be of highest preference to younger farmers. That's, uh, that's excellent now. So a clear message that technical information is actually where the first yes. phonology is at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we, we've got we've got a, a variety of questions that have come in, and and, and I'm delighted to, to know that Tony Pettit, who's head of education within Chagas, is online. So Tony, thanks very much for for taking time to participate in in the session today. And uh, Tony has a question directly for John Maguire. So John, if you're if you're there, Tony was was really taken with a question with your presentation about problem based learning, and was particularly interested in whether there was any evidence about whether problem-based learning was more suited to particular modules or topics. Okay, uh, thanks John and, and thanks to Tony for contributing with the, the query. Um, that question was put to the teachers as part of the focus group in the, this study and there is a kind of a workshop setting where they were asked in their particular modules was there a certain area they thought it would be more suitable to and the results that came back was that every teacher found some area in their topic really that was most suitable. Uh, I did mention that at level six subjects were the ones that were more suitable. The reason here was that they were more management based and um, they were more kind of an in-depth, whereas at level five, it can be a little bit more definition based foundation knowledge. And that's maybe some of the reason why they veered to more, or more towards level six modules. But as regards specific topics or specific modules, each teacher really found some area of module that they could, whether it was applied breeding, grassland management, ruminant nutrition, they all found areas basically that they could incorporate in a problem-based scenario. And um, that was ba that's basically the, the answer to the question. Yeah, everyone came up with some area. So there wasn't anywhere in particular, no. So John, can I just paraphrase that? To, I, th I think what you're saying is that all topics lend themselves to problem-based learning and it's really down to the, to the teacher uh, and the imagination to be able to develop how we, how we take that forward. Exactly. So every teacher could look at things differently, come up with different scenarios. It's really up to the individual basis to look um, at, at their scenario and where they could best fit it in or where they could see it working best. Thanks, John. And um, thanks to Tony for, for the question. Uh, I'm, I'm coming to Margaret. We've, we've got a question for, for you, Margaret, but specifically uh, is, is asking uh, what I think is quite a, a sort of philosophical and deep question, which says, um, did the participants recognise that lack of diversity within their classes and within the education setting was a problem. Um, yeah, thanks, John, and thanks to the person who put in the question. Uh, yeah, some did see it as an issue. Some didn't seem to perceive, perceive that they had a lack of diversity um, at all. Say, for example, they talked about some diversities and not others. However, to address them not believing it to be a non-issue or to be a to be a non-issue, um, it does need to be addressed as Ireland becomes increasingly more diverse, so will Chagas Education and all of Chagas as an organisation. 
Um, I don't know how it would be addressed. I suppose that will come in my recommendations further in this research. And um, maybe, as I mentioned earlier to your question, um, around more discussion, more awareness, more exposure to the issues that are involved in Chagas diversity or for diversity in Chagas education. Thanks, Margaret. While we've got you on screen, we'll maybe ask you a, a supplementary question. So, so I think there was a particular comment about uh, travellers and non-Irish nationals and, and how we might engage them more in agricultural education. Um, my experience in, in, in Ireland is that those two communities are heavily engaged in our industry. That, that, that they work in our, our industry. So do we need to have some particular targets to try and bring them into the fold for education? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point, John. I, I think it's a little bit probably out of the scope of my research, um, as in attracting people into the education in the first place. Um, but it's definitely something that has to be considered, and I'm hoping that it will come as a recommendation towards uh, the end of the research. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Teresa, we've got an online question for yourself, if you're available. So it's a question from Paul Maher. And, 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 and Paul is asking how we could engage farmers on something like hedgerow management in a more positive way. Do you have any insight into that for us, Teresa? I think Teresa has dropped off the call. She was struggling with bandwidth earlier, yeah. wasn't she? So if Teresa comes back, we'll, 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 maybe, we'll maybe jump in and, and see if we, can, if we can catch up there. Um, there's a question for, for, for Maraid, if I can then. Maraid, if you're available. Yeah, I'm here. Perfect. Uh, so so, so Maraid, there, there was a question that came in that, that was asking about, uh, should we rebrand distance learning? I think it was one of your recommendations, uh, but, but have you got any ideas about what that rebranding might look like? Well, in my recommendation, the reason I came up with, um, I suppose, the rebranding of it was from my research and talking to education officers and students, there was a misunderstanding and a variety of names people were using for the distance course. Some called it distance course, some called it an online course. Some didn't really have it, that it was a mixture between the two. So if we were able to create a format for the delivery of the course and going forward, describing it more as a blended learning course in the sense that maybe a full distance course is a bit misleading, but working for a blended course would be my aim for a rebranding of it. Thank you, Mairead. Uh, Aoife, if we've got Aoife live, can, could, could you answer a question for us, Aoife? So it was a question very specifically, and you might be able to anticipate this question. It was very specifically about the use of online assessments during the lockdown and the pandemic, and whether mm -hmm. there were any specific lessons that we could have learned during that process. Yeah, I suppose, look, when I started the project, it was online assessment, it was more looking at, you know, we were, we were still teaching in classes and we were going to think maybe we're doing our exams on the likes of computers, you know, to speed up corrections and feedback and so on. But little did I know when uh, March came around that I it was going to be thrown into the thick of it and everybody was going to have to learn, you know, the use of, I suppose, the platform in Chagas is Moodle and everyone's going to have to use Moodle and, you know, engage with students and assess them and, you know, they have classes and so on. But I suppose that's the way it has changed. It's We're using Moodle now on a daily basis. Um, you know, students are more engaged in it. I suppose when in March hit, they hadn't really seen it. You know, um, in terms of full-time students, they wouldn't have known anything about Moodle at that stage. So I suppose it was a struggle to get them to learn that. But um, any lessons, I suppose it, that would be one for any teachers out there. There's plenty of lessons to be learned. And I think just in the recommendations that I put forward, you know, like training and so on, and I suppose just continual uh, feedback and evaluation of online assessment and the use of it um, in Chagas education just needs to be looked at in the future. So yeah, there's many lessons to be learned, but again, I'm sure we'll get through them now from now on. Thanks, Aoife. While we've got you on screen, we'll maybe ask a supplementary question, which has come in. Uh, so so you, in, in your recommendations, one of your recommendations was that we needed to think about learner support and how that might look for, for online assessments. And the question really was, do you have any insight about what, what, the, what the demands might be and, and what the help that learners might require if we move to more online assessments? 
Yeah, I suppose when, you know, again, going back to the lockdown, we had, did have to assess students who do require learner support in a traditional exam setting. So, you know, I suppose it was just a phone call, maybe going through them with the exam and stuff like that there, trying to talk them through how to complete the assessment. That was how we done it uh, back in March. But I suppose going forward is just to make sure, giving them an additional support um, for the system that we're using for online support or online assessment, um, making sure that they fully understand it. And again, it's just to support them. I suppose it depends in what, what scenario you're in. Like if, if there is a lot of uh, students that require learner support, it's a little bit different. But again, I, I'm not too sure what way it's, it's panning out for this year uh, for that. Thanks very much, Eva. Ro Roisin, we're coming to you. Uh, there's a there's a question uh, specifically for for uh, you, you about the CPD programmes, and and the question is: w Did you have the opportunity to look in other countries or maybe other industrial sectors for CPD programmes and how they might work? Um, yes, yeah, so as part of my literature review, I would have looked at um, Dairy Pro in the UK um, and also Dairy NZ um, and there was, there was a few more as well, but that was the extent of it. That's, um, I just only looked at it as part of my literature review. I didn't, um, I suppose, look at it in any more depth in terms of case studies or anything as part of, um, as part of my actual study. Yeah, so that was the extent of it. Rasheen, I'm pretty confident that question came from Helen Brooks, who's uh, okay. <laughs> the manager of Dairy Pro in the UK, uh, and an ex-colleague of mine. Uh, and, yeah. and Helen would have been in Dublin watching you live, I'm sure, if, if our opportunity was there. So uh, if, if you if you want to make those contacts, I'm, I'm confident that AHDB would be delighted to, to talk to you about that Perfect. system. Thank that, you. Uh, in, 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 t in terms of the process. Uh, okay, we're, we're, we're going back to uh, to, to Maraid, and, and, and the, the question really is around uh, the diversity of needs for online learners, and, and whether there's anything that you've found in terms of insight for that, uh, Maraid, please. So for students who, the common types of students, the learning needs, we have students maybe with liter new, literacy needs uh, or issues that are struggling with maybe the reading or writing. If you incorporate the use of digital evidence, um, the younger generations, they're very technology literate and they know how to use their phones. So instead of writing essays um, based on answering questions, um, for an example would be if you have a question on farm biodiversity, instead of maybe getting them to write an essay on it or answer questions on it that require them to maybe write it down, that they use um, their mobile phones and technology to maybe create a video with listening to them talk on about the subject, create a podcast. Um, the using incorporating digital evidence can maybe reach a wider community and you're maybe hitting the same learning objectives, but going a different way rather than the more regular um, written answer format. Thank you. Thank you. That's really good. So the questions are, are, are really flowing now, and, and unfortunately, we've got a f only a few minutes left. So, so these may be a couple of uh, quick fire questions, if we can. So, so Niall, I'm coming to you. There's a question about: um, Is there any evidence from your study of how Chagas could better connect young farmers through the targeted use of media? Um, I would think that to target younger farmers um, that more information, I suppose, further information could be made available through perhaps some form of, a, of an app. I know, for example, some milk processing companies have apps that they release information out to. Um, you know, I suppose maybe Chagas could maybe focus again further more so on the on the social media side of the house from, from Facebook to, to Twitter to get information out there. But I would, you know, strongly you know, encourage that information is kept concise and short because some of the recommendations I got back from my, my research was that um, farmers have a time constraint and have limited amount of time they can spend reading. So I suppose short, uh, timely articles that are concise and easy to interpret. And furthermore, then farmers are seem to be willing, based on the study, to implement change when they see kind of a success story. So so look, if they if they read about a success story from a farmer who went from A to B and now is you know doing a lot better than what he was previously, that kind of information seems to be more uh, perceived to 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 encourage greater change on, on other farms. Like so, I would say through the through the social media, but keep it concise and keep it short and to the point. That was a big um, uh, finding I found in my study and in literature as well. 
Thank you. Thank you, Niall. Uh, Roisin, we're coming back to yourself. So again, if we can keep keep, keep it uh, succinct, but it was a very specific question. So the, the, the individual says it was a really good presentation. Thank you. Um, CPD is important for young people and for graduates in particular. And do you think that there are students who have completed the green cert who might be interested in doing more CPD modules? So any evidence of, of, of demand for CPD modules from young people, I think is a question. Um, Okay, um, well, I suppose the, the majority of um, participants in my study, they would have been young people. So they would have been, um, I suppose, I think nearly 80, 90 percent were um, under the age of 40. So it was um, very representative of the um, younger farmer. And I suppose um, within that, then there was um, demand evidence. So there was um, those farmers were requiring CPD. So um, from that, I suppose there is. Um, there is a, a demand there that answers the question. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, I'm just going to check, but I, I don't think we've managed to make contact with, with Therese again. So, so Monica, maybe um, we, one of the things we could do at the end of this session is, is make sure that uh, any of the unanswered questions that have come through on, on the forms are actually directed to the individual uh, students, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want the audience to feel uh, unsatisfied if they haven't had their questions answered in terms of that. So maybe if we can uh, d do this in, in terms of a process. So um, I, I know that there are still many more questions that are being asked out there, but I'm really sorry. We're on a very tight schedule. And according to my watch, it's now time for me to, to, to wrap up the session. So I, I, I want to start by thanking the audience. I absolutely appreciate that, that this is not the conference experience that you would normally have. And, and at this point, you'd be dashing out of the doors to get pastries uh, and, and refreshments. Uh, and unfortunately, we're not in a place where we're, we're able to do that. But it's been fantastic to have 180, 190 people engaging in this process. So really grateful for that. My second thanks is, is to our eight presenters. Absolutely brilliant, thought-provoking research which has been completed there uh, in terms of a process. So, so well done to all. And, and then my final task, I, I think I'm going to check with Monica just to make sure I haven't missed anything, but my final task is to encourage everybody that's in the audience now to, to take that comfort break and to, to get yourself a cup of tea and to reflect upon what you've, you've learned and you've heard today, but to make sure you're back at your desk at 12.15 for the next session. And the next session is chaired by uh, Dr. Marion Beecher, and it's focusing on labour, human and animal welfare on farms. So, so quite a lot there to get your teeth into and, and some really exciting presentations to come. Thanks John. Yeah. Thanks all. Enjoy your cup of tea.